Hey, welcome back, everyone, to Plant-Based Kidney Health. As always, I'm Dr. Sean Hashmi. I'm a board-certified nephrologist and obesity medicine specialist. And my partner, as you know really well, is Michelle Krosmer, the famous dietitian who does everything renal-related. So, Michelle, I think we have an important topic today, which is very much misunderstood, and that is oxalates. So let's just dive right into it. Let me just start with the basics. So could you tell us what the heck are oxalates? Why should people with kidney disease even care about them? Yeah, so to put it simply, oxalates are a compound um, that are mostly found in plants, and they're also an end product of metabolism. So we eat them, and then also our body can synthesize or make them. Um, so from the standpoint of our body making them, the liver play a big role in this. They um, synthesize the oxalate from certain precursors of oxalate metabolism. So an example of that is vitamin C. So that's one of the reasons why high dose vitamin C supplementation is not recommended recommended for people with kidney disease or kidney stones because it can increase oxalate levels in the body. Um, but then oxalates also come from the diet. And I think this is the one that people typically um, have a lot of questions on. Some examples of where they come from in the diet are like higher oxalate foods, spinach, Swiss chard, beets, rhubarb, almonds, raspberries. Um, we're going to get into that a little bit more later on, like high oxalate foods and low oxalate foods. But people with kidney disease should be aware of and educated on, on oxalates because the kidneys are responsible for excreting oxalates in the urine. Um, and whether someone with kidney disease needs to worry about them or not is what we're going to talk about in this video. But I think one of the important things is if someone has high urine oxalate levels, that's typically when it's a concern. Um, and something to know is that most people with kidney disease and even most people with calcium oxalate kidney stones don't have high urine oxalate levels. Um, but we're going to get into all of that. So Dr. Hashmi, how does someone know if they even have need to be concerned then with oxalates? Is there blood work, your analysis? Mm -hmm. um, like what's normal? What's high? When would they need to be mindful of that and concerned? Okay. So this is a really critical topic. So <laughs> let me tell you a little bit of the scientific basis for all this oxalate stuff that you want to understand. The big concern for oxalates really comes out of the idea that they're going to lead to scarring or fibrosis in the kidney, damage the kidney, lead to dialysis. And when we talk about diseases, it's important to understand there's really four different diseases we're talking about. So the first category is primary, hyper, which means too much, oxaluria, the end uh, part of that word basically telling you it's going in the urine. So there's primary hyperoxaluria type 1, there's type 2, and there's type 3. Now, the majority of people end up having type 1. And that's essentially with 1, 2, and 3, you're spilling a ton of oxalate in the urine. But then there's a secondary hyperoxaluria, which we talked about from, you just heard Michelle, which is really around too much intake. And what are those things? So there's some things that you know, like vitamin C, for example, it's a precursor for oxalate. So we get it. But the other one is that if you start to mess up your gut bacteria, that can help to increase oxalate absorption. And one of the worst things you can do is juicing. So as you've heard about me say all the time, especially on the obesity hat that I wear, I'm absolutely against the idea of juicing. What juicing ends up doing is, is if you're doing vegetables, especially the ones that Michelle mentions on high oxalate, you end up creating a lot more water load with it. And so when the cells lining your gut, when the water hits with the oxalate, the water is able to get through very easily in between the cells. And as a result of it, you end up getting lots of oxalate that's absorbed by juicing. So juicing gives you a lot more of that oxalate. Now, when we talk about diagnosis, there's several things. There's clinical. So we talk to you, we look at what's going on because oxalate deposition isn't just a kidney issue. It can occur all over the body. So first is clinical. Second is radiological, meaning we do ultrasounds. Sometimes we do CAT scans. We may be doing imaging of the heart even to look for oxalate deposits. Then there's biochemical. And what I mean by that is there's blood test, and of course, there's urine test, looking for oxalate concentrations. And then there is histopathological, meaning we biopsy the kidney or the organ in mind. And all of these things, plus genetic studies, which would be looking specifically at hyperoxaluria. So when I get a patient that I'm worried about, 
usually it comes in the form of, you know, somebody got a kidney stone. And, you know, if that's the case, we would do a 24 hour urine collection. But in addition to that, we're also doing imaging. Now, it's important to image not just the kidney, but kidney to the ureters, to the bladder. In other words, you're looking at the urinary tract. And what you're looking for is a fancy term called nephrocalcinosis, which is a way of saying you're looking for calcium oxalate deposit all along the tract. And so as you start to measure these things and you want to get an idea of what's considered normal oxalate, what's not, you have to remember that you'll see on your own lab reports at home that it's adjusted for the body surface area. And the reason that's so critical is because, you know, if Michelle uh, weighs twice as much as I do, therefore, if I don't adjust for that body surface area, her number may look abnormal, even though it's perfectly fine. So oftentimes you'll hear values like the 24-hour urine for measuring oxalate normal is about 10 to 40 milligrams per 24 hours. Above 40 is really you start to get into hyperoxaluria, but we want to take a step back and make sure it's being adjusted. So you'll see that there'll be a value that will say the amount per 1.73 meter squared body surface area. This sounds very complex, but you will see your nephrologist always talk in these terms because we're adjusting for your weight size. So that becomes very important. The second part of this is, you know, there are other things depending on if it's primary hyperoxaluria one, two, or three that we can look for. For example, we can look for urinary glycolate levels in pH one or primary hyperoxaluria one. We can look for urinary glycerate levels for pH two. We can even measure plasma oxalate levels. So in other words, we can measure these in the blood. And the reason that matters is if you look at somebody who is on dialysis, we know that with dialysis, oxalate secretion is going to go down because your kidneys just can't get rid of stuff. So when you see that somebody has primary hyperoxaluria and they're on dialysis, they might have a value greater than 80 micromoles. But normal in dialysis is about 30 to 80. Now, here's the kicker. Normal plasma oxalate levels in somebody without dialysis is only 1 to 5 micromoles per liter. So you can see 1 to 5 versus 30 to 80 in dialysis. And then the last thing is, as we said, histopathological. So for example, we may end up doing a kidney biopsy. But one thing people don't realize is sometimes we have to send them to the dermatologist because we'll see lesions on the skin. And those lesions are important because they can look like another diagnosis called calciphylaxis. So we need to know, is it because you have too much calcium oxalate deposit? So that's a mouthful. So the bottom line here is, is this is where you absolutely need your nephrologist to be on top of things. And it takes not just urine levels, but urine, blood, clinical, tissue samples, imaging, all sorts of things, including genetic, to get the final answer. And is there, and I, I guess I anticipate this question coming up. So in someone who has kidney disease and doesn't have any history of kidney stones, is there any um, like way or reason that they would know or should be having testing done to see if they have high urine or blood oxalate levels or any of these other things you talked about? Or I guess what symptom right. they may be having? <clears throat> So you wouldn't necessarily have any symptoms unless there's deposition. And if you have normal kidney function, it's going to do a fantastic job of getting rid of oxalates. You can overwhelm the system, certainly, but if you got normal kidney function, then you're going to be in a position where things are still going well. Gotcha. And so then is there any research showing a negative impact of people with kidney disease eating foods that are high in oxalate? Right. So remember, this is where the secondary hyperoxaluria comes. Remember, primary, pH 1, pH 2, pH 3, is all about the fact that you're excreting. Secondary has to do... <clears throat> I feel like I've been sick now for like six months or something. But secondary has to do with intake. 
So we just talked about the part where you can reduce your oxalate intake, your vitamin C plays a role, but here's what people don't understand is, is when it comes to calcium intake, calcium intake because calcium in the form of food is going to end up binding with oxalate inside your gut and then hopefully you excrete that out. So getting rid of vitamin C becomes a very important thing as far as that goes. But high oxalate foods, you're increasing the burden of oxalate on top of your already hard working body. So that extra oxalate is going to get absorbed. And that's why having a diet rich in whole foods that are rich in calcium will bind to that, not calcium supplements. And then the other part that becomes important is, is when we start to talk about this sort of secondary hyperoxaluria part, you know, some of the things that become important to focus on is to alkalinize the urine. And how do you alkalinize the urine? changing your diet to a predominant whole food plant-based diet. And what you end up doing is whether we give you bicarbonate or you're doing it on your own or we're like supplementing and so forth, what alkalinization will do is it will actually help to prevent those things essentially from mm -hmm. forming um, calcium oxalate complexes. So you'll have these bicarbonates that will complex with the calcium decrease the amount of calcium that's available to form calcium oxalate. It's a fancy way of saying that eating a plant-based diet is one of the incredibly important things you can do to prevent more damage from hyperoxaluria or too much oxalate. The other thing that people forget is pyridoxine, which is just a vitamin over the counter. We will prescribe that because that will also be helpful as far as that goes. And then another thing that people don't necessarily think about is probiotics. So specifically, there are certain probiotics like oxalobacter formagenes, which uses oxalate as a source of energy. And the reason that matters so much is, is if you can increase that inside your gut, the oxalate that's coming in there, less of it will go in there. So bottom line, as we start to think about it, if you're eating foods high in oxalate, they're going to affect you if you have kidney disease because the clearance is decreased. As a result, it will get stuck in there and start to complex with calcium and deposit all over the body. So Michelle, with all of that background, what are the foods <laughs> high in oxalates and vice versa. What are some foods that may be lower in oxalates? Okay. So I'm going to dive into, you know, examples of that. And I just want to reiterate what you had kind of been talking about, but remembering that the absorption of oxalate um, can vary based on the diet. And so with gut dysbiosis, um, you know, there are problems like gas and bloating and acid reflux and all these things. Those are signs of gut dysbiosis. Um, people following the standard American diet are more likely to have that, but you can have higher oxalate absorption. And then even people who have had um, like bariatric surgery, inflammatory bowel disease, short bowel disease, if they have fat malabsorption, that can also increase the absorption of oxalate in the gut. So it's, it's, of course, it's not this as simple black and white of like, these are high foods, don't eat these, and these are low foods, don't eat these. Um, but that is something to keep in mind. Um, and how you mentioned calcium, same thing, magnesium is something that's important to have adequate amount in the diet because that also impacts oxalate absorption. And a lot of the foods deemed as like high oxalate because they're coming from plants can also be good, great sources of magnesium. And so we can't just be like, oh, I'm not going to have any, any foods with oxalate. Um. But getting into kind of high and low oxalate foods, what is considered um, high? You know, there's no just standardized like chart of these are high, but there's a big difference between like the very high oxalate foods and high. So spinach is one that, um, of course, we commonly hear. One cup of spinach is over 600 milligrams of oxalate per cup. And you compare this to like kale or mustard greens, which are two to four milligrams of oxalates. So it's a huge difference there. Um, most other high oxalate foods that are over 50 milligrams of oxalates are nowhere close to spinach, you know, 600 milligrams. So for example, a quarter cup of almonds is 120 milligrams of oxalate, one cup of raspberries, 48 milligrams of oxalate, and half a cup of navy beans is about 76 milligrams of oxalates. So those are all considered high oxalate foods, um, but they're nowhere near 
how high spinach is. And you mentioned like the juicing, a lot of times where people come get into trouble is they're having, they're juicing and having very concentrated amounts of these super, super high oxalate foods. You think people normally juice spinach and beets and stuff. Those are, that's a lot of oxalates at one time. Versus if you had a couple spinach leaves in your salad, that's completely different. Um, some lower oxalate alternatives to these things above. So I mentioned almonds are going to be high in oxalate. Walnuts, pecans, and pumpkin seeds are all lower oxalate nuts and seeds. Um, raspberries are higher in oxalates, but strawberries, blueberries, cherries, apples, pears are all low oxalate fruit. And of course, there's tons more than that. Um, as far as like the legumes go, navy beans are high in oxalate, but chickpeas, lentils, green peas, mung beans, kidney beans are all lower in oxalate compared to that. And then as far as the greens go, you know, Swiss chard, um, spinach, uh, beet greens are all very high in oxalate, but bok choy, collard greens, lettuce, kale, arugula, endive, mustard greens, um, there's a lot that are lower. So we can't avoid eating oxalates and we don't want to avoid eating oxalates because as you see, these foods that I mentioned, they have a lot of other benefits to them, fiber, antioxidants, magnesium, and other nutrients. Um, and Dr. Hashmi, you mentioned the urine like urine chemistry. And so I think it's a good thing to point out that meat is a food that is very low in oxalates, but if you consume too much of it, it can change the urine chemistry by lowering the pH, lowering citrate levels, raising calcium levels. And then those are all things that can, you know, cause those calcium oxalate deposits or kidney stones to form. And so, you know, ultimately if someone has urine oxalate levels, um, and they need to limit it, then typically if they start with, hey, I'm going to avoid these highest oxalate foods, that's usually enough to help low in the, lower the urine oxalate levels, um, lower the levels in the body, and make it so that those more moderate or even moderate to slightly high oxalate foods aren't a problem, especially when they're paired with enough calcium and magnesium in the diet and getting enough fiber and have good gut health and all those other things that we talked about. So anything you want to add on oxalates, Dr. Hashmi? No, I think this is a really important topic and I think we covered a lot of it. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions though. Yep. We'll see you guys next time and leave your questions in the comment section. Thank you guys.